Good morning. Are you enjoying your breakfast? I'm going to encourage you to keep eating quietly, but keep eating during the presentation because you don't want to let all that get cold. I'm Karen Gersten. I have the honor of serving as the president of Kendall College, and I'm absolutely delighted to have you here today. Um, this is our first Global Hospitality Spotlight event, and it's presented in partnership with Hotels Magazine. It was spearheaded by Hospitality Management Dean Jeffrey Cottrett, Jeffrey, um, and with the support of his advisory board, so all the members of the advisory board, thank you very much. And the event is designed to bring together the hospitality management community so that together we can explore the trends and topics that are affecting today's industry. In the audience today, and I'm sure you've met each other because you're all very social, we have a wonderful mix of industry professionals from Chicago's top hotels and hospitality associations. We also have advisory board members and members of our Eta Sigma Delta Honor Society students. So students are over there. We have hospitality faculty, members of our staff. And I want to tell you that as great as this room is, and it's fabulous, this is far from a local event. If you haven't noticed all the technology in the back of the room, um, it's because we are streaming this event. For those of you who don't know, Kendall's a member of the Laureate International Universities Network. And we have um, institutions worldwide recognized as among the very best for higher education and hospitality management. So we are streaming this event live today to nine of our sister schools around the world, included, including campuses in Brazil, Mexico, Ecuador, Panama, Costa Rica, Portugal, and Spain. And I welcome those of you who are viewing us from around the world, whatever time it may be. Yeah. We're really glad you could join us for this. I'm personally very excited. I read Mr. Fuller's book, and there were so many ideas that resonated with me. I taught communications for many years, so I was glad to, uh, to read those sections. I, and I'm really excited to hear more. Before we get started, a couple of things. If you have cell phones, Blackberries, iPhones, please turn them on silent. Thank you. And if you are tweeting about today's event, please use the hashtag KC Spotlight, which you can reference on the bottom of your menu. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jeff Weinstein, Editor-in-Chief of Hotels Magazine and a member of our School of Hospitality Management Advisory Board. He has taken a very active role in helping us plan this event, and he will walk us through and it, the event, the conversation for the rest of the morning. In addition to moderating the session, I'd like to ask Jeff to come up now and introduce our speaker, Mr. Ed Fuller of Marriott International. Please join me in thanking Jeff for his commitment to Kendall College. Enjoy the day and keep eating. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the inaugural Global Hospitality Spotlight. I hope this is the first of many. Uh, it's a privilege for me to have the opportunity to moderate this session with Ed Fuller. And let me tell you a little bit about Ed before he comes up and talks about uh, his career in the hotel industry. Ed has logged somewhere north of 10 million miles in the air. So his, the title of his book, You Can Lead on Your Feet, You Can't Lead on Your Feet uh, on the Desk, You Can't Lead with Your Feet on the Desk, couldn't be more appropriate with a man who's, who's in the air more often and, and parachuting into new cultures all over the world. You have to really respect somebody who has spent 40 years taking Marriott and making it a, a true global business and being able to go everywhere from Tunis to Dubai to Bali and wherever it may, may be and really not know the, the culture, learn the culture, and more than anything else, build those relationships. Uh, you have to give Ed incredible credit for what he has done for Marriott. And he talks about relationships more than anything else. 
Uh, as far as he's concerned, you know, the management contract that everybody has to sign to develop a hotel better left on the shelf and to manage the hotel and manage the, the relationship between owner and manager through friendship, through common interest, and through understanding. And, and I think that's what Ed has preached uh, over his career and has what, is what made him so successful at, at developing Marriott around the world. And, and sometimes those relationships can take on very unusual and interesting experiences. He told me about one owner that decided to choose a management company based on the size of the head of the person that the, he was looking to work with. So good thing for Ed, he had a big head <laughs> and, and got that deal done. Um, so you never know what the experience may be and, and what may be important to an owner and a developer. And you have funny experiences like that. And you also have very serious experiences. Um, we all know what's been happening around the world uh, economically, politically. And I know Ed was on the ground in Cairo uh, right in the middle of the transformation that's been going on in Egypt and there to reassure his people on the ground there, his associates, and make sure that you know the Marriott name stays proud and tall in, in a situation like that. And I know he's heading back there right after uh, he's done here to finish uh, the Ritz-Carlton that is going to open right next to the square where, where the protesting is done. So no doubt an incredibly interesting, uh, enjoyable, and fascinating life that he is explained in his book, and uh, it gives me my pleasure uh, to introduce Ed as the first inaugural Global Hospitality Spotlight speaker. Ed? Well, good morning. good morning. Just wanted to see how many were morning people and how many were evening people. <laughs> Pretty good distribution. Do finish those meals, it's delicious, it's a great product. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Kendall College for inviting me. It's good to be here with you. I think it's interesting to note that uh, as we turn on the news any morning, that I always get nervous to see what's going on next, either financially or in the world today. The world has certainly changed, and in years past when I gave a speech, I was concerned about convincing people that it was a global world. Well, we all know it's a global world. That issue is no longer there. Uh, when I first got into the international business in Marriott, I had to pay everybody $20 to use the term global. One day, Bill Marriott came in, used global six times in a speech, and asked for the $120, which I did have to fork over because that was part of the deal. Today, everybody knows it's a global world. So in our business and in our industry, having gotten past that point, what I think has been really amazing, and you know, this in part is more for the students than anything else, is our industry is truly a global industry. Your student body here is made up of many nationalities. I think 65 was quoted to me. Uh, it is essential today that we take a global look at our industry and the changes. Now, I'll do two minutes of sales on Marriott. I know I have competitors in the room. But, you know, <clears throat> I will say that Marriott has gone through its changes, and we as a company, start, when I started 40 years ago, we were 22 hotels. Today, we are 3,700, and I didn't check my BlackBerry this morning, but I think we're somewhere around 85, 3,785. That's a transition. That's growth. But we've gone through many different business models to get there over those 40 years. And internationally, in 1990, we started with 16 hotels outside the United States, and today we're at about 551. 
we are in a global market for a number of reasons. The primary reasons are that when you have 18 brands, see how I got that plug in there? When you have 18 brands ranging from Ritz-Carlton and Bulgari to uh, our Fairfield Inns, you need to be approaching the world on a global basis. So we are outspreading our brands to not only create business in the markets they're in, but also to create business to bring people from those markets to our other markets in a global world. One of our problems today in the United States is our visa system and our immigration system. And frankly, a stimulus package, this is my political pitch, a stimulus package that can help this company dramat country dramat dramatically and our industry as a whole is to open our doors to more international travel. Therefore, as an industry, whether you're in the United States taking care of customers, whether you're in Rwanda, whether you're in uh, uh, Beijing, or even uh, in uh, Peru, you need to understand culture and you need to be able to work with different people. Because this industry, thank God, is still about people and will remain about people. And in our hotels in the United States, we have probably over 21 different countries represented in the operation of our hotels today. But more importantly, we have customers who will come from other countries. And it's your ability to interact and work with those various areas that will make our industry successful. So when we saw the Russians coming to Thailand, we were quick to adjust product and to ensure that we had Russians there to greet them from our hotels in Moscow. When we had sensitivity to language, when we have sensitivity to food product and understand our customers, we are way ahead of the game in this industry. And as we are more global, it is essential that we really focus on that. Now, I've talked to you about uh, our business. I've talked to you about a company like Marriott that's growing. There are competitors doing the same thing. And frankly, in this industry, if you're a student today, you've got more opportunity than ever before. But I think it's helpful to understand the changes. Our business model in Marriott has gone through many shifts. We started, like many of our competition, as an ownership company. And we've gone through various phases of approaching management contracts because we wanted to expand. And today we're into franchising. And many of the large companies in the United States are also focused primarily on franchising products. That means that there is a new industry, not that new, but relatively new, who is looking for the Kendall graduates. And these are the operating companies that operate for many different brands. And that means in my mind today that Marriott in the US is really a brand company with a management component. Brand company because those 18 brands are one of our strongest and most important assets. It is also an opportunity for these brand companies because most of our competitors are headed this same route to find good people not only to take care of the brand but also to take care of the customer, either through the operating companies or through our own management companies. Ten years ago, if a student asked me how important is it that I get a master's, I would have said, do the work, go with the opportunity, and see where it goes. Today, if your focus is marketing or finance, I strongly recommend, in addition to your hospitality education, that a master's needs to be in play. Because the industry's sophistication is growing 
by leaps and bounds. Today, we talk about the internet as if it's old history. Marriott had a, diff, uh, had a clear view that there was something there, and I'll get to social media in a minute, and a gentleman named Shafiq Khan that serves on in our company and another gentleman named Bruce Wolf came to meetings saying, we've got to get into the middle of this. Today, Marriott is the seventh largest seller of products on the internet. I'm not talking about against other hotels. I'm talking about against Amazon. We, do, we will do over $7 billion on the internet and sales. And that leadership came through teams of people working to try to anticipate a consumer need. We're working today on social media. The real issue is not what's today. The real issue is what's tomorrow. Our concerns have to be about a changing industry that is still about hospitality, service, and understanding the customer need. And for Marriott, that's essential. Outside the United States, the world is also changing. And while Europe has changed dramatically, especially in where food is served in the hotel versus freestanding restaurants, Middle East and Asia continue to see food and beverage as a huge component of our industry. Today, Asia is growing at a pace that we have never seen as far as our industry is concerned. Growing with products like we've never seen. And we believe our multi-tier approach to being able to provide three luxury brands, Bulgari, Ritz, JW Marriott, as well as lifestyle brands like Renaissance, Autograph, and Edition, as well as focusing on extended stay like our Marriott Executive Apartments and our residence inns and our town place seats and our select service courtyards and Fairfield inns give us a physical advantage not only in the United States but in other countries. Multi-branding is a real strategic step. And the fact is, customers are segmenting. Doctors segment. Many industries today are becoming specialists in their area because the customer wants it. They have specific demands and needs. So we've touched on a couple of real change areas in the relative short time that we have to talk. But there are two things that I think remain important whether we look at this industry and its many changes and look at this industry in the perspective that the changes will continue to come. And that is how business is done. Now in the United States, relationships aren't what they used to be. And I am a proponent that that needs to change. We can turn on the TV and we know relationships don't exist in Washington, D.C. That's pretty clear. There are two groups of people that really need a course on relationships. Used to be there, it was in the back room. Of course, we're in Chicago, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> and it has become a situation where more and more today, we need to use relationships in our selling as well as our business. Regretfully, in the United States, when something goes wrong, there is one answer. You all know it. We sue, right? Look at the smiles. You know that's the truth. I break my toe. Kendall College owes me money, right? I go out and sue. 
I don't care what goes wrong. I fall down. I get in trouble. I sue. Our associates turn on the TV. They may have had an accident, and there's a lawyer ready to sue their employer. This is not the real world. The rest of the world doesn't work like that. They work on relationships. And relationships are what our business should be. You touched on it. When the contract should stay on the shelf, we should have common interests together as owners and as people working together in the management of their hotels. Relationships should be how we get customers to come to our hotels. And that requires skilled sales, marketing people that can really do relationship selling. All too often, we get into the mode that a friend of mine's found in the basement of his home the other day. Six young ladies sitting around, barely junior high and high school, everybody tweeting away. <laughs> My thumbs don't work very well, but you know, they were tweeting away. And he walked into the basement and he said, what are you doing? To his daughters. Well, we're here, uh, we're tweeting to friends. Who are you tweeting to? Each other. They were talking to the same six people sitting there. There is no communications in that. So, you know, I used to walk into my office and I'd walk down, the, we have cubes in the corporate office. God, we have more cubes than anything else. And I'd say to one of the people, what are you doing? Well, I'm sending a message to Sam. I'd say, Sam is two cubes down. Get up and go see Sam. Talk to the man. <clears throat> the fact is that we aren't using those skills today to our advantage. And we've got to bring that back. Hospitality, think about you come to the front desk and the clerk goes, and you go, what are you doing? I'm waiting for you to respond. <laughs> what kind of room do you want? Here, and put it down. That's not our industry. We're supposed to be there to greet the customer. Or, uh, or think about the person who's serving a table, not coming over the table, but sitting up in a booth, waiting for you to send them a message. You know, you lose the warmth of the experience. Our industry is about personal interaction and warmth. And part of the experience is not only the food, which was excellent today, I might note. Part of the experience is the person you're interacting with. And you have to have that to truly have a great dining experience or a great hotel experience. That's relationships. And I, with two and a half hours, I would sit here and make an argument to you for the value of relationships in our business. And I encourage the education side of the world to create environments that force the students today to be involved in relationship building while they're in education. Teamwork is everything in our business and it hasn't changed, and that aspect won't change. Now, one of the things that I am the proudest of in Marriott is culture. And the other day I was in Long Beach, California, and I had an opportunity to talk to 1,200 FBI Academy graduates. Now, I walked in this morning feeling very good because I knew you weren't armed. <laughs> they were. <laughs> so I was a little on the edge of my seat when I went in to talk to 1,200 FBI Academy graduates. And uh, I was not there to talk necessarily about the hospitality industry. I did talk about the importance of relationships. I did talk to them about the importance of keeping their guns in their holster. I did talk to them about a lot of things that were good in our industry, 
But what I really spent time on was culture. And what I'm, we're in 72 different countries today. What I've really learned about our different business environment is the fact that the cultures in each country are special, they're unique, and they're important. And usually when I spend time with the class, we spend a lot of time going into the differences that cultures have and why culture is important. And I believe that it is essential as we grow in a global world that we focus on something that builds in relationships but deals with culture. And that is respect, trust, and clearly listening. Now ladies, I realize the men are not very good in that last skill. That is not our strength. But if we're going to work in a global world, we need to take the listening skills to build the relationships and the trust that makes a relationship work. If you have in your culture the same philosophy that many other cultures do, you have the opportunity to experience what you might want to bring to a business culture. Each of us have a culture. I don't know where you are from, but each of us come from a culture. Kendall College has a culture. And I would argue that one of the things I am the most proud of is that Marriott has a culture that is 85 years old. We believe that that culture is what sets us apart as a company. Let's spend a little time on that. How do you take a North American-based company culture overseas? Well, first we have to define what is culture. There is a brand promise. A brand promise is not a culture. It's, not, it's part of a brand culture. Ritz-Carlton, ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. That is part of Ritz's brand promise. And each of our 18 brands have their own culture. All you have to do is attend one of our GM meetings and you can see the difference between a courtyard meeting and a Ritz-Carlton meeting. Ritz-Carlton meeting, everybody's got their gold cufflinks on. Everything's very uptight and in good shape. Go to, go to a courtyard meeting, they're banging on the tables, they're shooting silly string across the... Uh, they are about excitement, fun. But each of our brands engenders, as part of their mandate, their culture within the brand itself. Marriott, though, has what I call a culture of values. And these values are something that we are taught year after year. It is the values that were established 85 years ago by our founder. They work in a global world. They work in the US. And they are why you find a large number of Marriott people with 40-year careers. I am not unique. I am part of the family. The culture has values, and the values are what sets us apart. So let me explore just one of the values. Take care of the associate. The associate will take care of the customer and the customer will come back. Those words mean a lot more to a Marriott associate. They mean that we, the manager, have responsibility for the associates that work for us. 
Certainly the associate, the frontline individual will take care of the customer's needs, but our first job is to support that associate. It is a statement that Marriott has made for all these years. It is a statement that truly sets us apart. But to have a value work, it has to be tested in a number of ways. And I will share with you a couple of the mechanical tests, but I will tell you right now, it can be measured and there can be payback. We have been doing for almost 50 years employee opinion surveys, 50 years. It's institutionalized in the company. And guess what? Internationally, as head of international, we had 80,000 associates around the world, something I'm most proud of, about 6,000 managers. And 20 years ago, those jobs did not exist. So we have created with our values, a new group of associates in a global world. They take the same employee opinion survey. And I know that based on the results of that survey, my bonus is impacted and everyone that works with me is impacted. When you impact somebody's bonus, you get to focus on the value. That's a principle we don't have to write down. It's somewhere in one of your texts. If you impact a bonus, we as managers, though we were told it during orientation, though we've heard it from Bill Marriott, and though we as managers talk about it all the time, it's reinforced. And what gets reinforced gets done. What gets measured sometimes gets manipulated, but what's reinforced and what's done is something that supports that value. But you want to know that the value has real return, not only for your business, but for the people. And some of the value also means we develop our people within the company. It speaks to our training programs. It speaks to our mentoring programs. It speaks to how we focus on people to grow them in the industry. <clears throat> we taught, you mentioned Cairo. <laughs> so I'll use this kind of as a closing story and something I'm very proud of. And a couple of people have heard this. So we're in Cairo. And companies have crises, and one of my jobs has been crisis management for international. But we have a philosophy about our people. And when Cairo happened, and I was in Bangkok when the red shirts were uh, encircling our hotels, so I'd gone through this before. But I was in Egypt, along with a couple of my folks, to be with our associates during the turmoil. And we landed there on February 4th, and we visited all seven of our hotels. We had four functions. Number one, shake hands with as many associates as possible. I am not a rock star. Bill Marriott's a rock star. But I represent Bill Marriott when I'm there. And I believe I shook about 14 or 1,500 hands, all thanking him, smiling, trying to look cheerful, while these people were going through hell. We also met with our owners and tried to reassure them that we were going to be there, though they were having difficulties. We then would meet, oh, well, we also walked all of the security stations to show in a symbolic fashion that this was important. And then we would sit down with our managers and either have a meal or spend time and listen to their stories. Listen, because they all had sad stories or something touched them directly or indirectly. When we got to Cairo Marriott, a 1200 room hotel in the center of the city, uh, the executive team was very proud. 
Our GM was in Boston having open heart surgery, so the team was holding the hotel down led by the resident and the executive committee. At a certain point, you may or may not know, the Minister of Interior pulled all the police off the street. Crowds were in the street, crowds were around our hotel. We had all of the reporters in our hotel, except for Anderson Cooper, who was in an undisclosed location, <laughs> which, by the way, was the Ramsey's Hilton. I know that room very well. <clears throat> he later came back. <laughs> but we had a really tenuous situation because our security is unarmed, as appropriate. We rely on the police. What were we going to do? The executive chef had the answer. Our culinary team marched out to the three gates, carrying knives, and backed up the security team. The housekeeping team came with their brooms, followed by the engineers with their shovels. They held those three gates for four hours against crowds. And when you talk to them and ask them, why? They said, this is our hotel. Those 600 people in the hotel were our guests. We can't let something happen to them. It's our responsibility. It's Marriott's culture. Thank you. Well said, well said, Ed. Uh, culture means everything, I think, to just about all the people here who are involved with organizations or schools like this. And um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about uh, how you manage relationships. And we're going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes of question and answer here. I know there are some roaming mics that are in uh, the room, and uh, I'm going to start off with a few questions, and then I'm going to ask for anybody from the, from the floor who wants to ask something of Ed. We'd, we'd love to have your questions as well. But let's talk about relationships, Ed. You've, I don't know how many hotels you've been responsible for developing around the world, uh, quite a few over a long period of time. I, I would love an example of a situation where you were trying to win a contract trying to get a hotel in some foreign land where you might not have known the culture as well as you may have liked. And how did you build that relationship? Give me an example of, of, of where you had to go in, get to know somebody, earn their trust, and get them you know, to come with Marriott. Tell me how you do that. Well, if I, if I can maybe switch the story a little. Sure. We had a 10-year contract in uh, a country in South America. And uh, admittedly, the ownership was at best difficult, especially during the 10 years. And it was time to renew the contract. And our team had been on the ground for some time. And there were two partners, uh, one the generals of the country, because in this particular country, the generals own the land and the other was the individual at hand. And negotiations had gone on for about um, at least uh, six months, and it was going nowhere. It was absolutely going nowhere. My lawyer called me up, who speaks perfect Spanish, who understands the, the culture, and the COO called me up and said, we've got a problem. We don't know what's going on. You need to come down here and kind of show the flag. So we went down and we met with him in his hometown, not where the hotel was, but the hometown. We did no discussion, no discussion about the contract. We looked at his investments. We met his family. We spent time with him for two and a half days. Had not one word about the contract. Six weeks later, we had the signing ceremony. Nothing changed. He wanted face. He wanted someone 
from Marriott, Washington to come down and spend time with him and to show that we cared. It was about the relationship, not about the deal terms and the contract. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned earlier about all the, the when the went down to, a friend went down to the basement and saw all the kids just sitting there on their little PDAs texting each other, not having face-to-face -face right. repartee. So again, let's talk about how do you build a relationship? How do, you, how do you get to know somebody? And this is probably very good for all the students that are watching that don't do as much of that as they need to about actually getting to know somebody on a more personal basis with the hopes that it builds a well, more of a, a professional. When I do a class, I walk up to a student that I pick out in the crowd and I shake their hands and I explain that in America, we now have a relationship, and I ask them if they'll buy the book, and they embarrass say yes. I know they won't. But, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I say, and I can sell her something. So I'm going to go back to my office, and I'm going to put a check mark and say, I have a relationship, and I've made a sale. Outside the United States, that isn't even an introduction. Relationships are built differently in different countries but they come with time because you've got to show respect, build trust, and you've really got to listen to the person. In some countries, you do not talk business over the meal. We just broke a relationship rule here this morning. You do not spend time on business at all. You focus on the person and you develop that. And I don't care, in some markets, a China in particular, a relationship comes over years of building that trust, of giving of yourself, and I'm not suggesting anything, anything at all about bribery. I'm talking about giving help when somebody needs it and offering to assist people when they're in trouble. We have owners who go through the same personal challenges we do. They have difficulties in their lives. If you're there to help them, be part of it, and support them, you start to build trust. But it comes with time, and when I initially was in the business, I was the region. Then I was able to develop regions, and we pushed the function of relationship management lower in the organization. So today, except for the owners I've known for a long time, we put that responsibility on our area vice presidents because it is such a personal thing. Mm -hmm. You do not pick up a phone and call someone and say you have a relationship. You get on a plane, you go sit down and solve problems face to face. Very good. Um, you're developing all over the world. Interesting times right now uh, from a hotel development perspective. Uh, we all know what's been happening in China and in India, Brazil, Russia, a lot of development. Some might say it's even getting a little overheated, and some might say that India is, uh, the engine in India, India is slowing down right now. So talk to me, hopscotch the globe for me a little bit, and tell me where you see really interesting opportunities to develop right now. Well, I'm, I'm pitching a little here with 18 different brands we are in different phases in each market. Mm -hmm. So in Europe in whole, as a whole, we're not doing as much on full service as we are doing on our select service brands and our, res our uh, Renaissance residence inns, our select service courtyards, Fairfield inns, and the like. Why is that? That's because we filled the full service market in most cities, and we met the objective. There are always more cities that can use a good hotel, mm -hmm. but there are Marriott hotels in most of the key cities. And so it is now time in Europe to bring in those other brands, and we recently created the AC brand mm -hmm. by bringing an existing brand in Spain into our partnership which gave us a new select service brand that we will also bring into Latin America. When you go to Latin America, growth is clearly the major cities are covered with Marriott hotels. So our focus again is in the select service area. Can you go into Latin America a little deeper? What markets in particular you think 
where the potential lies right Brazil, now. Brazil, Mexico are huge, large markets. The others will be more one-off. We've opened a courtyard in Ecuador. We'll open a another we'll open another full service product in Cusco we will still go around on as a whole but your large markets primarily are Brazil and Mexico I've heard a lot about Colombia lately Colombia we've got three potential projects underway but can't announce them but we've just opened a JW Marriott in Bogota Marriott in uh, uh, Bogota and obviously the others will probably move toward courtyards more than a full service uh, selection. When you move to uh, when you move to the Middle East and Africa, that is really new ground. Uh, we we've been trying to get into Africa for years. The problem has been financing. Uh, frankly, someone solved that for us. The Chinese. They are there today to build, own, and uh, build in volume. We have. We're under construction in Rwanda, and it's owned by Chinese, financed by Chinese, and being built by Chinese. We're under construction in Ghana. We've got two others that we will announce this week. We are moving into that market uh, with a vengeance, and we've assigned two developers to sub-Saharan Africa alone. Across northern Africa, we've been there a while longer, but we've got a number of hotels. We plan to double of our existence in the Middle East and Africa in the coming three to four years, bringing us from 50 to 100 hotels. Mm -hmm. And that is a market that is still focused on full service, but in the long run will shift again to the select service areas. Asia, wide open market. Uh, it is growing fast. We have 30 hotels in Thailand. I never thought I'd see the day. We're there. Uh, clearly, China is still moving. Uh, we have in, we're close to 70 open, another 29 under construction. And you're right. It will go through cycles like we've been going through cycles in the United States for years. Mm -hmm. It'll get a little overbuilt, and then it'll move on and pick up. And frankly, Beijing's come back from the Olympics faster and better than any other Olympic city in the world, and we pretty much expected that. India, we have been very, very fortunate in India, and we have a lot of projects. We're about 17 open, and we have another 25 in the pipeline, and we're moving aggressively in those markets. Asia is still primarily about full service, but we've introduced Fairfield in in India. We're moving with courtyards in China. We're starting to bring in our other products mm -hmm. uh, in those markets. And the United States continues to grow, especially in the select service. The autograph product has really hit both in Europe and in the US. Great popularity. We've got several addition projects underway uh, in Europe and in the US. Good. Um, you know, anybody who claims to have a crystal ball to predict how hotels are going to perform in 2012 is probably, you know, selling something that they shouldn't be selling. That being said, I'm going to ask you anyway, Ed, uh, as certainly based on your great experience and your, your, uh, your travels that take you all over, where do you see strength in 2012 from a performance perspective and where do you see weakness? Well, as a U.S. stock traded company, I've got my limitations, so I'm going to stay very vague uh, because I'm not allowed to give you projections. Uh, in general terms. In general terms, uh, I think that you're going to see continued growth throughout Asia and the Middle East uh, with improving results primarily uh, coming uh, in the... Um, markets that you would expect. I think we are working our way back to 2007 levels, but you can look at the Middle East and understand that there is still turmoil there, so it's a little slower. Uh, there are great questions about Europe. I will tell you right now, no one knows what's going to happen there. Uh, we were very, very excited, and we've been moving very aggressively in Europe over the last year or so. Uh, the United States, politically, who knows? The problem with predicting what's going to happen is the only thing we know today is that we don't know 
what's going to happen. And I don't think today that forecasting has the same metal that it had even three or four years ago. There's just too much going on in the world to give a real good prediction. I hope, hope is different than prediction. Yes. I hope we see a gentle continued growth along the lines of what we've seen in 2011. Great. Um, any questions from the floor? Anybody who wants to stand up and, and uh, offer a question? And the gentleman in the back here, right here? Why don't you wait for the microphone? What? What? Hold. Ted Mandigo. Um, I'm on the uh, faculty at Kendall. Um, how does you address as an international operation the um, issues of living wage in developing countries? Uh, how do you handle the associates that work for you from a standpoint of compensation integration into the country's uh, wage scale? Um, it's interesting. Any country that was communist in Europe uh, I think is the model for a lot of the emerging markets today. And in particular, uh, I watched Poland. When we opened in Poland uh, about 20 years ago, uh, we had bellmen that were doctors because we were paying better than their socialized medicine market at the time. Uh, we had sophisticated staff because at the time hotels were ahead of the local market. We have seen a very continued growth off a relatively low base over that 20 years to where today the Polish market is very much tied to the European market and wages. And we have adjusted with the market uh, dynamics. You will look at China and you will watch the provinces closest to Hong Kong going up faster than the ones further away from Hong Kong. Each of these countries has to be looked at in its own context. And we as a company have always been a belief that we provide not necessarily the highest pay in the country, but we pay appropriately as compared to the competitive set and the market needs as a whole. There is no question, especially in an emerging market, that the companies we serve then come and try to pick off our employees because they're very impressed with them. And we've faced that ever since we entered our first emerging market. And we have to remain competitive. Did that nail it for you? I'd just be curious to hear more about the property you announced last week in Haiti. We're pretty excited about that, uh, candidly, because uh, it will be a successful business venture, don't get me wrong, uh, but we feel we're contributing to Haiti at the same time. And Ray, we put a team into Haiti to look for an opportunity when some of our competitors were not. And we actually have one of our franchisers also looking for a second project to put a courtyard into Haiti. Uh, the hotel, I think, will be a symbol of a rebirth for a country that is obviously going through extremely difficult times. But I will assure you there is demand and there is opportunity in a country like Haiti uh, for, for hotels and for the industry. It'll be business. It'll be professional initially. You could hope that someday soon it will be tourism, but it'll start as a commercial hotel. Any other questions from the floor? Got one right, right here. Good morning, uh, Nabil Mubayed with the Hotel Palomar here in Chicago. Uh, I had a question about the ownership relationship piece, given the uh, unpredictability of next year and 2012 and, and beyond. You know, how do you best talk with owners about perhaps being in a position where the expectation is lower than what they signed on for? <sighs> Well, uh, it's interesting. Now, some things we need to establish. In a global market, most of our owners, with the exception of some in Europe, are individuals that are in long-term plays. That is very true outside the United States. Inside the United States, you're dealing primarily with institutional ownership who may have a shorter view, a shorter window, and a shorter set of objectives. Uh, so the conversation really shifts. Internationally, 
you can personalize it and you can look at it as a bump in the middle of a road on a long road going to a common interest. In the case of an institution, I think candor, <laughs> straightforward, and ensuring that they understand you're giving the maximum effort to try to solve the problem. Frankly, sometimes it's easier to deal with an individual who you understand their long-term objective than it is to deal with an institution who has a shorter-term objective. And I want to lighten up the mood a little bit. Um, you've had logged 10 million miles. You've been in countless, countless meetings, countless relationship building experiences. Tell, tell us about one of the funnier stories that you've, you've had. The, where I don't know if it was the meal or what you had to do to build some trust. Just give us something amusing that you've had to deal with over. Well, over I'll all the skip years. over eating scorpions in northern China because that was the test of my willingness to commit. <sighs> I, uh, I guess one of the best events that I participated in happened to me in Japan. Because it, when I first worked in Japan it was in the 70s when I was opening our sales and marketing office there. And at that time, you could not get, you could not help a woman into an elevator before you. Because the rules were extremely clear women waited for men. And I stood one day for 10 minutes until one of my new sales guys said, Get in the freaking elevator, the lady's not going to get in. <laughs> Uh, and so I was in Japan, this was about 10 years ago, and we were meeting with bankers, and I had one of those dinners that you have, and I was the only Caucasian in the room. And we were talking, and when, when the conversation gets a little slow, I immediately fall to history. Remember, we weren't talking business, we were talking social. And it was getting a little slow, so I moved to the, to the subject of, well, you know, I know the capital of uh, Tokyo is Edo, and I, I, I remember a second capital, but didn't you have a third capital? And the, you know, the 10 gentlemen went, mm, which was not unusual, but it meant they didn't know they were thinking about it. And the young lady who was serving me immediately blurted out the capital. And the heads went up, hmm? <laughs> and she said, you know, Japanese men don't think Japanese women know these things. And I'm going, oh my God, <laughs> what have I started here? Oh, I'm in a lot of trouble. I have other objectives. We're in the middle of something I didn't want to be in. Well, we go through a few more conversations, and I said, well, I guess things are changing in Japan. Mistake number two, <laughs> because the answer was not necessarily for the better. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, well the young lady never reappeared. So I am really concerned. I excused myself to go to the bathroom, I went outside, sure enough, she's guarding the shoes. This is not good. So I walked up to her and I said, how long have you been here? Oh, five years. Do you enjoy your job? Oh, I, I really do. Um, is this a career? No, I'm a second year law student. I went, okay, and I took off. She was fine. <laughs> Things are changing. But again, I made some mistakes not being sensitive to the culture at the time. And just, they, they were unnecessary in going on. We did do business. I did not get the hotel. But I don't think it was a result of that night's dinner. Okay. Uh, one last question. I know we've got to wrap it up here. A very quick, quick question. Um, 10 million miles. That's a lot of miles. Mm -hmm. And hopefully 40 years down the road, the next Ed Fuller will be sitting in this chair answering these questions. And hopefully they're watching, you know, here or in the room here today. How do you manage to to survive 10 million miles on the road. Give us a travel tip. <laughs> well, I, I, we talked earlier, I, I sleep a lot on aircraft, uh, but I always focus myself on the location I'm going to. So I've got a stop in Washington and then I take off on uh, Friday for Cairo. Uh, I will get on that plane and I will ask what time is it in Cairo 
Sometimes I know, but it's always good with the time changes to be sure. And if it's evening, I go to sleep because I want to be able to hit the ground running. Now, we have large regions now, so my job isn't necessarily going to be replicated. I'm, uh, I will be replaced by other people that will run the regions closer to the market. But I was with Marriott during a pioneering era. But if you take a message from Bill Marriott, Bill Marriott, who will turn 80 this year coming up, Bill Marriott saw 250 hotels this year. Wow. Key executives, if you believe my book or if you believe me, have to get out to where their product is. Sitting in an ivory tower or a corporate office does not get you the relationship with your people, the understanding of what's going on in the markets, or a true understanding of the business. So there will be an Arnie Sorensen, a Bill Shaw, a Bill Marriott in one of your classes who will be looking at the company as a whole. And they're going to have to fly. And they have not invented uh, Scotty's little uh, device from Star Trek that <laughs> beams you there. But until they do, that is going to be part of our culture and our work life. Great. Well, thanks, Ed. It was a pleasure spending some time with you today. And Jeff, I think you're going to uh, close out the session. I am Jeffrey Gatred. I'm the dean of the hospitality school here at Kendall College. I'm Karen, I just wanted to tell you that I have been listening and that I will be physically, personally carrying Ed out of the building so that he cannot stub his toe on the way out. <laughs> I'm figuring we will build a relationship in the process. I'm, this little present here, which we wish to give to you, Ed, is something that is normally given by our CEO to a new school that is entering the Laureate Network, the Laureate family of schools. We want to give this to you as a way of saying we believe now that you are a part of our Laureate family, a part of our Kendall family. We hope that any time you're back here in Chicago, you have an opportunity to do so. You'll drop in, have lunch with us, have dinner with us, uh, or drop into any of our sister schools worldwide. Because we hope now that we do have a relationship with you and a relationship that we will be able to carry on for many years. Thank you very much, and I assure you I will not drop in, so you'll be safe. <laughs> Thank you. We also wanted to thank all of you here in the room for attending today. We would like to thank those who are attending in foreign countries, who are attending elsewhere in this building for being with us today as well in our simulcast. I'm, we would also like to point out to you that you have a, an evaluation form in your um, uh, folder. Please do fill it out. Please give us any ideas you might have for other speakers you'd like to see in the future. And I'm. Ed will be actually signing his book, his book you will find in the bag that you have with you there. And we're going to have Ed stationed back here in the back corner and he will be doing a book signing for the next few minutes for anyone who would like to get their book personally signed. Again, one more thank you very, very much. Thank you, Jeff, for moderating for us. And we look forward to seeing all of you in our next installment of the Global Hospitality Spotlight Series. Thank you very much. <laughs>